Let your loving kindness, O Lord, be upon us as we have put our trust in you. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. The setting for today's gospel may or may not be familiar to us in some respects, but I suspect it is. Jesus' ministry is growing. He is healing people. He is spreading a message of hope, justice, and liberation. There is also great suffering, deep violence, and rampant inequality. Desperate people are seeking answers, and by the thousands, they have come to hear Jesus, this previously unknown prophet, speak. Some are even beginning to see Jesus as the Messiah, the Son of God. It is in this context that Jesus speaks of them, to them, of a new kingdom, of God's kingdom. Now, talking about the kingdom of God can be dangerous, especially when you have the Roman emperor who's not exactly fond of other folks who would be king. So Jesus tells stories. We have images of a kingdom. The kingdom is presented as a gift from God. And right before today's gospel, Jesus calls on those listening to strive for that kingdom, to work for it, to accept the gift, and to be ready for it through action. There is a combination of certainty and uncertainty. God's kingdom is coming. God's Justice is coming, but it involves patient waiting and work. It is in this context that Jesus commands people to sell everything they own, to give alms, to build up treasure in heaven. Now, there have been many folks in Christianity who have taken this quite seriously. Those who, after prayer and discernment, have found themselves called to the work of poverty. Two of them were Dorothy Day and Peter Maurin, Roman Catholics in the 1930s in New York City both active in social movements and very much engaged with the thought of their day. Their city and the United States as a whole was in the middle of depression. And they decided to create a paper for the workers, a Catholic paper for the workers, and to open a house of hospitality. Dorothy Day grew up in the United States and may have been the more activist of the two, conventionally. Peter Marin grew up in France and had ideas, utopian ideas, about a future where there was food and shelter and space for all, where all could create and live together, live full lives in community. In recounting the early days of the Catholic worker, 
the house they founded. Dorothy cites a poem written by Peter regarding utopia. In his typically playful manner, this was his thought on the subject. The world would be better off if people tried to become better, and people would become better if they stopped trying to become better off. For when everyone tries to become better off, nobody is better off. But when everyone tries to become better, everybody is better off. Everyone would be rich if nobody tried to become richer, and nobody would be poor if everybody tried to be the poorest. And everybody would be what they ought to be if everybody tried to be what they want the other fellow to be. Peter was an optimist about this, but he also knew that this involved hard work. It involved writing and conversation and what have traditionally been called the works of mercy. Feeding, clothing, caring. The kingdom is coming and we are called to participate in the work of the kingdom. Paul also tells us about God's reign. He uses language of a city, the city of God, connecting it to the faith of Abraham and Sarah, the founding father and mother of faith in God as the Jewish people received it. And they were an old couple, but even so, they were promised a child. They were sojourners, travelers, and yet they were promised a land. And as he sought to follow Christ, and as he built communities in cities around the Eastern Mediterranean, Paul writes of the city of God that is promised. Paul had plenty of time when he wanted to talk about the injustices and wrongs in the cities where his communities lived and worked. But he also had a vision of God's city coming for those who were willing to work for it, those who were willing to receive it. This is not so different from those who seek a better place today. Some are Christian, some have other identities, but there is, in general, for hundreds of thousands, millions of people, a desire for something better. The desire, the author Warsan Shire has written, maybe home is somewhere I'm going and never have been before. The queer black educator Darnell Moore has also written that to live, we must put an end to those things that would otherwise be cause for our own funeral. And the historian Robin Kelly has said that without new visions, we don't know what to build, only what to knock down, and calls for a process that can and must transform us. As Christians living in the United States today, I believe this is a large part of our work. 
the violence in El Paso and Dayton is symptomatic of a deeper violence. There has been violence along the border between the U.S. and Mexico in those borderlands for over a century. Unless things change on a deep social level, that violence will continue in some way or another. The writer Michelle Garcia has identified that very border as a theater, a place of image, of myth, of the construction of reality. We can think of the myth, the story of the cowboy. Many cowboys were Mexican, indigenous, African-American, but you would not know that from the usual narrative. In much of popular American culture, the cowboy is white. The cowboy is rational and plays a role in civilizing an uncivilized land. I do not believe such narratives serve us anymore. When Jesus speaks of a kingdom where all have plenty, where God's reign has come fully into being, he says so in response to the ways we as humans tend to organize kingdoms. The anxiety the fear that we will not have enough to eat, that we will not have shelter. That drives a lot of what people do. And God understands this. However, by clinging to that fear and acting based on that fear, we may be prevented from seeing the image of God in each other. We may be prevented from reaching a place of sharing where all can grow, where all can be who they are called to be. So, I think it is important to recognize this, whether it is our property or a particular fear of ours, there are things that many of us must let go. The artist, musician, and educator Andre Henry often likes to tell people in regards to our society that it doesn't have to be this way. We can create a better society. He's also written that this will require thinking beyond the ways our society is functioning right now. There is a lot of racism, not merely personal hatred, not merely bias, but the accumulation over centuries of inequality that must be dismantled. And those with privilege have a special role to play in dismantling that. This involves a form of dreaming, a form of planning, that like the kingdom of God, we cannot assure the timeline on, but it is our hope. So as we think of the perhaps familiar words about our treasure and our hearts in today's gospel, I invite us to think of what this means collectively. What does this mean for St. John's? What does this mean for the cities, towns, the places where we live? I pray that we can hold on to hope in God's kingdom, even as it may be unseen, while we participate with God in bringing about the world 
that is promised. Amen.